Hi, this is Duncan Ferguson. In this unit, we're going to talk about the uh, calcium home phosphate homeostasis and focus on basically the roles of uh, the ions calcium and phosphate. And then later units, we'll talk about the regulation of these ions. The calcium in the extracellular fluid is tightly regulated, and we'll talk about a number of factors that uh, are involved with this regulation. Uh, phosphate in the extracellular fluid is also regulated, but it's done so with, uh, less strictly. Uh, the physiological roles of calcium and phosphate are obviously involved with uh, the skeletal integrity, or calcium is known as an intracellular second messenger involved in muscle contraction. It impacts the transmembrane potential, is involved with blood clotting, uh, platelet function, and is a factor for and a cofactor for many enzymes. Phosphate, of course, is uh, important for the energy store ATP and for second messenger systems like cyclic AMP. As we mentioned, calcium is uh, tightly regulated within the body, but it's important to recognize that what is regulated is the ionized version of calcium, because calcium exists with, with, in three different uh, forms, um, protein bound, that which is uh, complex to anions. By the way, protein bound is largely bound to albumin. We'll talk about that in the next slide. And leaving about 45%, which is the biologically active form of calcium. And uh, this is obviously also relatively diffusible uh, through capillaries. So this is the fraction that's tightly regulated. Acid-base disturbances can impact the ionized calcium because albumin, if you look at the center of the slide, uh, is negatively charged, and calcium and hydrogen ions um, can bind to these negative charges on albumin. And so at normal pH, we have a, a certain distribution that leads to our roughly 45% that's ionized under normal circumstances. However, if we look at a situation where we have more hydrogen ions, this can actually knock off calcium from albumin and increase ionized calcium. Uh, so that's why, in a clinical setting, it's really most important for us to measure ionized calcium. Conversely, in a high pH or alkalotic situation over on the right-hand side, you can see that uh, calcium can be more tightly bound uh, because there's less hydrogen ion competing for it. And so in this case, the ionized calcium would decrease. What about uh, phosphate? Well, phosphorus uh, is present in phosphate salts, PO4-3, uh, in plasma. We have normal concentrations. Uh, most of it is free and diffusible, and uh, only a small percent is non-diffusible, and most of this is in bone. About uh, less than 1% of it is uh, important because of its interactivity uh, through the energy stores, ATP, through the second messenger signaling cyclic AMP, and of course, in phosphorylated proteins within the cell. In future units, we'll talk about the various um, ways that the gut, the kidney, and the bone can influence calcium uh, handling and the, and the hormonal uh, effects upon those uh, systems. However, let's just take a look at a typical calcium flux in a 20 kilogram dog. Uh, so if, if the animal takes in calcium, uh, first, of course, it's absorbed um, through the GI tract, but only about 20% uh, of it is absorbed. You can see much of it is, is excreted in the feces. Of the part that is absorbed, it then can go into, as we just discussed, the various forms in the extracellular fluid volume, uh, which include the ionized protein-bound and complex form. The... Uh, Parts that are ionized in particular can be excreted, and we see we lose another 50 milligrams there, and only a tiny amount um, is um, then in interchanging with the skeleton. So about 250 grams is present in the skeleton, 99% of the calcium, and, uh, but only of that, about one gram is rapidly exchangeable. Uh, in various exchangeable forms, and we'll talk about how osteoblasts and osteoclasts are involved in uh, 
and helping to exchange the bone within the animal. So we have a significant amount of calcium that is that never is absorbed. We have some that it's taken in, some that's urine, removed in the urine, um, and only a small percentage that then gets remains within uh, the skeleton, depending on you know a certain metabolic situations that we'll talk about. But of the calcium within the body, 99% is in the skeleton. So to reiterate, 99% of calcium is found in bone. Uh, most is found in the form of hydroxyapatite crystals, uh, which is a very complex uh, formula. And very little of the calcium, about a gram in a 20 kilogram dog, is in what we call the rapidly exchangeable pool. And this is the pool that uh, will be amenable to uh, impact of osteoclasts and osteoblasts under the influence of hormones that will be discussed in, in the future. So it's, it's a good time to talk a little bit about the, the cells that are involved and are being impacted by um, the, the hormonal regulation that we'll talk about. Firstly, we have the osteoblasts, and these uh, synthesize and extrude collagen fibers which form the uh, organic matrix called osteoid on which the bone is deposited. And it's deposited, as we said, in uh, it's a calcium phosphate form that cr is created as things mineralize. And this mineralization forms what is called the complex structure of hydroxyapatite. So the other cell type we have to mention is the osteoclast. Let's talk about its differentiation, its activation, because it's the osteoclast that will lead to bone breakdown uh, when calcium is, is needed. Uh, and so if we look at the figure on the right-hand side, we have, uh, here we have the osteoblast here, and then we have the osteoclast precursor here. What the osteoblast does is it produces uh, what's called the ligand of NF-kappa B, also called rankle. And this um, peptide then can lead to the, both the differentiation of an osteoclast, that's not going this way, uh, by binding to the rank receptor, it leads to differentiation of this osteoclast precursor to an osteoclast. It also leads to its activation. Um, in making it an active uh, to uh, reabsorb calcium and phosphorus. The key that we'll talk a lot about later is that this process, when we talk about the effect on the bone of parathyroid hormone, PTH, and 125-hydroxyvitamin D calcitriol, which is the active version of vitamin D, uh, rankle production of osteoblasts is under the influence of these two hormones. Now, the other way things can go is for the osteoblast to produce uh, a protein called osteoproteagrin, which uh, then can block rankle binding. And of course, when rankle binding is blocked, the bone resorption of an activation of osteoclast precursors to osteoclast is reduced. So the osteoblast is sort of the manager of all of this, and as we'll point out, is under the influence of PTH and vitamin D, at least in terms of its activation of uh, release of rankle and activation of osteoclasts. So bone mineralization requires normal osteoid, that's the collagen matrix, and adequate calcium and phosphate for precipitation. And it's key, if you remember your basic chemistry, um, that at some point of concentration of calcium and phosphate, when that product exceeds the soluble limit, you will get mineralization. And this is important to clinicians because with animals that have hypercalcemia, this limit, hypercalcemia or hyperphosphatemia, if that product uh, in milligrams per deciliter is greater than 45, you have a tendency not just to mineralize osteoid, but also to mineralize soft tissues. And this can lead to really, really big problems for the kidney. So um, overall, bone mineralization requires normal osteoid, uh, 
and adequate calcium and phosphate for precipitation on that osteoid. So there are three types of mineralization. There's the normal part uh, type that you know, we would hope would happen within the bone. Um, there's what we call metastatic mineralization of soft, soft tissue, which is what I alluded to in the previous slide, when there might be hypercalcemia or hyperphosphatemia and the product gets too high that it will start depositing, precipitating in soft tissues. And the ones that are most um, affected by this can be the kidney, the abdominal viscera, blood vessels, and the lungs. Of course, if you do this to the kidney, you can damage it permanently. And then there's dystrophic mineralization of tissues where you might have uh, some sort of injury, and this leads to mineralization regardless of the product of calcium and phosphorus. So in our discussion of the ions calcium and phosphate, um, first of all, it's important to rec recognize that ionized calcium, which is about 45% of the total calcium under most circumstances, is tightly regulated. Phosphate is less tightly regulated. Calcium and phosphate, of course, play big roles in skeletal integrity. Calcium serves as an intracellular signal um, and is important for contractility of muscles. And phosphate is crucial, of course, in energy stores and signaling pathways like cyclic AMP. The total calcium is distributed between protein-bound, mostly to albumin, complexed and ionized form, and it's the ionized form that is active. And as a result of this protein binding, acid-base disturbances, another positive um, cation, uh, hydrogen ion, can impact binding of calcium to albumin, leading to uh, either reduced calcium binding and increased ionized calcium, or in alkalosis the other way around, reduced ionized calcium. Osteoblasts are crucial to bone remodeling. They sort of drive, uh, determine what happens with osteoclasts. And that effect of osteoblasts is under the influence of two important uh, hormones, which we'll talk about in the next unit, PTH and vitamin D.